we're surrounded every day by curved objects. Roads, bridges, hills, and apples. But did you know that there is a deeper structure to reality most people never think about? This structure dictates how objects move from the path of a falling iPhone to the macro scale of the universe. Beneath every curve in a space, there is a hidden formula ruling it all. It is called a metric. And understanding it is like gaining access to the operating system of the universe. Imagine you were a kid playing basketball in your backyard. The ball bounces out of bounds and gets stuck in a tree. Classic. So you grab a ladder to get it down. Of course, you would need to adjust its height so that it is greater than the distance between the ground and where the ball is located on the tree. This means that you would need to create a right triangle, such that the angle formed between the ground and the ladder is less than but close to 90 degrees. Let's say 85 degrees. Otherwise, the friction force would not be strong enough to hold you still. Anyway, that's not the point here. The point is that all of these things, so lengths, angles, can be easily measured once you assume that we live in a Euclidean flat three-dimensional space which is a pretty good approximation. What we often fail to notice, though, is that when performing these calculations, we're also assuming a specific ruler or a specific protractor as the only available option. This is the standard Euclidean matrix. However, there are others. For example, the matrix 2000010001, which is a matrix in flat space, but not an Euclidean one because it is not proportional to the identity matrix. This matrix stretches distances in the x direction compared to the y direction. It basically says that one unit step in x is twice as long as it would be in the Euclidean matrix, but one unit step in y is unchanged. It is definitely a bad physical model for our adjustable ladder and tree illustration, but mathematically it is consistent. So, it really depends on the context. The bottom line is that the metric is just a matter of convenience, a choice. Now imagine you're not in your backyard anymore. Instead, picture yourself in a landscape, with rolling hills. You try to draw a large triangle on the ground, but something seems off. You sum up the angles that you measured, but they just don't add up to 180 degrees anymore. In some regions, the result is greater than 180, and in others, it's less than 180. Well, the issue is obvious, isn't it? The space you're dealing with is not flat anymore. It's curved. And now your Euclidean rulers don't work anymore. Geometry depends on the metric that defines how things are measured locally at every point. Here, you can still draw triangles, but not the Euclidean ones. The rules have changed, and the metric is the new rulebook now. At each point in this field, there's a sort of instruction manual, like a tiny blueprint, that tells us how lengths and angles should behave in the immediate neighborhood. This instruction manual is the metric. So instead of thinking about the metric as a straight ruler, imagine it's more like a guide or manual given to every point of space. It tells you, if you want to move just one unit north and one unit east, how much ground will you really cover? If you rotate something, what angle have you swept, based on how this region bends? And if you try to go straight, what does straight even mean here? If you're enjoying this video, don't forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. The neighborhood of each point will obey its own set of rules locally, dictated by its own metric. And the way these instructions connect across the surface defines the full geometry globally. That's what makes the metric so powerful. It's locally defined, but its compound influence is global throughout the entire space. Great, now that you have the intuitive picture of what a metric is, let's dive deeper with a concrete example. This is a two-dimensional space. I know it looks flat, but it's not, because we will define a non-trivial metric in it. The metric will be defined by this matrix. This metric is called a Poincaré half-plane metric, and can also be expressed this way. This will represent only the upper half. This is a space with constant negative curvature, so its Gaussian curvature is minus 1. 
and geodesics are either vertical lines or semicircles orthogonal to the x-axis, so they diverge. This is a hyperbolic space, by the way. How can we use this metric to measure distances? Let's say we want to measure the distance from the initial point, 0, 1, and the final point, 1, 3. To compute distances, we need two things. First, the geodesic curve gamma that connects the initial point to the final one, and two, to integrate the line element ds along this curve. Let's rewrite it using our own metric in this example. Well, let's calculate it. What we want to find is the curve gamma, or y of x, between two points by minimizing the length functional. This is a classic problem in calculus of variations. The integrand is also called the Lagrangian, and it can be represented this way. All we have to do is apply the Euler-Lagrange equation. But since f here doesn't depend explicitly on x, we reduce the Euler-Lagrange equation to the Beltrami identity. I know it doesn't seem so, but this is a great simplification of the problem. For more details, as with every video in the channel, check out the PDF link in the description. Then we plug this equation in the second. And that's what we get. We'll see shortly what the geometrical interpretation of this constant is. But for now, try to guess it on your own. Anyway, we can isolate y prime instead. And doing so, we can clearly see that this is a first order differential equation for y of x. Well, we can solve it. And after doing so, that's what we get. Therefore, geodesics in the Poincaré half plane are exactly Euclidean semicircles centered at the point x0, 0, and vertical lines are special cases in which the center is at infinity, so r tends to 0, or what is equivalent, c tends to infinity. Finally, we're ready to calculate the distance between the initial point, 0, 1, and the final point, 1, 3. We solved it analytically in the PDF link below. It was not easy, I gotta say, but the math we used was simply beautiful. Therefore, the shortest path between points 0, 1 and 1, 3 in this space is 1.2158, which is less than the Euclidean distance using the Pythagorean theorem. Actually, it is 45.64% less. Okay, it's time to review some of the things we talked about here but rigorously this time. Let m be a smooth manifold. A metric on m is a function that assigns to each point p in m a map, such that gp is bilinear. So for all a and b in the real line, and for all u1, u2, and v, vectors in the tangent space at the point p, this relation is valid. Of course, this is also valid for the second argument. Second, GP is symmetric, which can be translated into this equation. Third, GP is non-degenerate. So if GP of uv is zero for all vectors v in the tangent space, then the vector u must be the null vector. And fourth, the mapping from point P to the result of the metric is smooth for all smooth vector fields U and V on M. This means that the mapping G is infinitely differentiable, so it is C infinity. To finish the video, we'll propose an exercise. And as usual, we added its detailed solution in the PDF link in the description. Check it out. Let H be the Poincaré half plane. Then it is equipped with this metric, just as we've seen before. Your task is to compute the hyperbolic distance from points 0, 1 and 0, 3 using this metric. And I gotta say that this time, the path is gonna be 
a vertical straight line from the initial to the final point. Don't forget that on our website we have a section where you can send your own research. More details in the description. If you enjoyed this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there!